Love and How to Find It, in which we discuss the philosophy and theory of love in its many myriad forms. Today we're going to be talking about my theory of Princess Mononoke, one of uh, Hayao Miyazaki's most beautiful animated movies. We're going to talk about Zizek's theory of love. We're going to talk about the Lacanian Freudian symptom. We're going to talk about the death drive. We're going to weave that all in together and talk about Romeo and Juliet, about Tristan and Isolde. There's going to be a whole lot of things that we're going to discuss, so stick around if you'd like to, if you'd like to learn about that. Now, if you're joining us for the very first time, welcome. My name is Julian. About a year and a half ago, two years ago, I started hosting these online tutorials. Um, and look how far we've come. Um, last week we had 10,000 views for the very first time on our lecture, which is insane. I just want to say a big thank you to everybody who's joining us from around the world. Um, you guys know this already, but the biggest gift, truly the biggest gift you can give me is being present from different countries. I love that we've created an international learning community. We have students from so many different countries. And so if you want to make me really happy, just leave me a quick comment letting me know where you're joining us from. Um, I see Brazil, that's amazing. Germany, Schöne Grüße aus Washington, and Bon Dia to Brazil. Um, Sweden, that's amazing. Germany again, that's Malaysia, that's so cool. That makes me so happy. India, I think we actually have a lot of people from India joining. Philippines, um, I am so, so, so grateful. I'm so blessed to have people joining us from around the world. I feel deeply connected in a way that I never thought I would. So thank you guys so much. Um, that's truly incredible. Like Mexico, Mongolia, Austria, Romania. That's just unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> Jenaline is hanging out here in the background with us. You can see her between the ring light. I'm hiding behind the ring light. <laughs> we now have a ring light. And I promise you that next week we will have a microphone as well. Um, we actually ordered a microphone, but it didn't arrive on time. So hopefully by next week. Anyway. This is going to be the third tutorial in the On Love and How to Find It series on the philosophy of love. And my goal is to normalize taking love seriously, talking about what is one of the most universal and most precious experiences within human existence, and yet potentially also one of the most painful and one of the most dangerous experience of what it means to be alive. The pitfalls of love are clear, both the highs and the lows. And so what we're going to do in this tutorial is we're going to explore some of the philosophical theories appertaining to love and life and try to weave that in in a way that is hopefully valuable to you and that allows me to use some of my background knowledge on philosophy and theory to hopefully enrich your own self-reflection and your own ability to think about what love means to you and what it has meant and how you, how you experience loving and being loved, which is after all the most important thing in the world. And so in the next 60 minutes, we're going to talk about different ideas of love. And like last week, I want to start with Hayao Miyazaki. Hayao Miyazaki, who last week we talked about his theory of love as the encounter. And I have a little bit of a theory about Princess Mononoke, which is one of my favorite movies of his. So that's where we're going to start. But we're going to go through Romeo and Juliet. We're going to talk about Wagner. We're going to talk about Freud and Zizek and Lots of things along the way. Now, I just want to very briefly say that if you'd like to download these classes as a podcast, they're available on Patreon. The link is www.patreon.com dash Jeneline and Julian, um, which also allows me to keep these tutorials free because that's my dream to make these lectures open access available for anyone around the world, as we are doing right now. Um, but if you'd like to support these tutorials, you can head over to Patreon or send me a DM and I'll send you the link and help you get set up. I also want to very briefly say a huge thank you to everybody who signed up to our Substack. Um, I basically launched a new Substack and a podcast that we're going to record later today. Um, and we signed up 2,000 people, actually 1,998 <laughs> as of this morning. So we need two more people for the free newsletter. 2,000 people is just incredible. So a huge thank you to all of you. Um, the fact that like we're getting to normalize talking about these things is really, really important to me. Um, so I just feel super grateful. And a huge thank you to those of you who decided to support the Substack um, monetarily because we also have some founding members on Substack and you guys rock and I love you so much. I'm so grateful. 
Substack is a newsletter. Uh, you can sign up for free. There's a link in my bio, and I would super appreciate that. Anyway, all of that aside, let's start this tutorial because that's what we're here for. And make yourself comfortable. We're gonna have an interesting, an interesting discussion, I think. I'm not gonna sip coffee, but I thought you might enjoy this this Moomin mug. <laughs> I actually have a yellow robe like this, so that's me. Okay, so last week we talked about the fact that Hayao Miyazaki, the legendary animator of Studio Ghibli, has an interesting theory of love where he says that love is an encounter. Love isn't something you find, love is something that finds you, which means that love is something that changes your perspective on the world. It means that you see the world through somebody else's eyes, which means that you also view your own role in the world differently. And so there's a subjective, I don't know, consciousness shift that takes place when you are in love. That can be very violent, but it can also be very beautiful. Often it is a little bit of both. And I want to talk a little bit more this week about one of my favorite Miyazaki movies, which is Princess Mononoke. Now, if you don't know the basic plot of Princess Mononoke, it all starts when a demon boar, a giant boar, a demon god, shows up in a little rural village in ancient Japan. And the demon boar goes on a rampage because his body is infested by worm-like creatures that are devouring him. And so he is a demon that has succumbed to hate. Essentially, that is what he is. He's a god who's become a demon. He has succumbed to his own negativity, his own passions. And the young boy in the village who confronts this demon god is wounded by the demon god, and he has a mark on his skin. And this mark leads him to leave the village to go in search of a cure. He's essentially expelled from the village. And the villagers say, once you leave the village, you can never come back. And thus starts the hero's quest, the hero's journey, in which he will, of course, have the famed Miyazakian encounter of love in a very dramatic scene in which he locks eyes with the female antagonist, who is one of the wolf riders, a girl who lives with the wolves. Anyway, so my theory of Princess Mononoke, and I'm curious if you agree with me, is that not only is this a classic Bildungsroman, Bildungsroman being a German word for a literary genre in which we have a young protagonist who achieves adulthood by going through various struggles, that the arrival of the demon god and the mark that the demon god leaves on the young man is precisely the stigma, the stigmata, if you will, of passion itself, of the highs and the lows of love. That the demon god represents the dark side of what it means to love. And that once the young boy has been marked by the demon god, he is no longer a child. He no longer lives in a realm of innocent bliss in which there is no such thing as good or bad. There is no such thing as pain or suffering. And to think about that a little bit more, in an interview, Hayao Miyazaki himself said, that he can get very angry at times. And that when Hayao Miyazaki becomes angry, he doesn't feel rationally mad. Instead, he feels like he's being consumed by hate. The animator Miyazaki said that one of the things that he finds is that he loves animation so much that he can succumb to his own anger when things don't work out. And that his love and his hate are very closely attached. And Miyazaki very clearly says in an interview that the boar, the demon boar who is possessed by hate is Miyazaki himself. That this is the most accurate depiction he could come up with of what it means to succumb to irrational passions and hatred. And what's so important here is that Miyazaki's pointing out that this, this passion he feels, this hatred that consumes him, is not a hatred that exists from kind of pure spite or anger, but instead it's a hatred that comes directly from his love. And of course, that's exactly what happens in the movie, right? Which is that, spoilers for Princess Mononoke, the reason the boar god is consumed by hate 
is because he sees the world that he loves, the world of the great forests, being devoured by industrialization and human progress. And so what I'm trying to point out is that the experience of love can also be the first experience of some very negative emotions, that hatred and passion and hatred and love can be something that are intimately connected. And of course, what happens, for example, within politics is that the best way to get people to hate is precisely to convince them that the thing that they love is being threatened, that their nation or their tribe or their family is existentially threatened, and therefore a convenient scapegoat or antagonist is created who will essentially be blamed for that. And this is also what happens within Princess Mononoke. I really do believe that this movie is about the dual sides of the same coin, which is love and hate, about how we can succumb to hate precisely because we open ourselves to love, and that we realize that there is no strict division between good and evil, that the world is more complex. It's also why Miyazaki has often said that his movies, even though they're comforting, shouldn't be about escapism. Instead, they should be about the real world, the paradoxes of the real worlds. Because escapism is about a comfort, comfort, comfortable narrative about good versus evil, good guys versus bad guys, in which the hero always wins. And yet, within most Miyazaki movies, including Princess Mononoke, the hero doesn't necessarily win. It's much more Wagnerian in that usually at the end of the movie, the hero finds himself confronted with a new world that is as of yet unexplored, that may contain the potential for great good, but also the potential for great evil. And that's exactly how Princess Mononoke ends, with a renewal that is also an empty slate. And so I don't want to go on about Princess Mononoke, but I believe that the stigmata that he bears on his arm, the wound, as it were, Princess Mononoke's wound, is precisely the wound of passion, the wound of passion that can consume him. For example, the more he uses his arm as a superpower, as a strength, the more it begins to consume him. And so the experience of life and the experience of adulthood is in, in a sense mastering your passion, but also allowing yourself to succumb to it. Knowing when to yield to your passion, to allow yourself to let down your guards, but also understanding the flip side and the reverse. Oscar Wilde has a great line where he says that heart was meant to be healed. And this is in a sense also what Miyazaki's movie is, right? That the wound was meant to be healed. And love, and I think this is very important, and I think that we really need to stress this, love is the wound that heals itself. Because love isn't one thing that can be wounded by something. Instead, love can be the thing that wounds. Love can be something that wounds you more deeply than anything else. Loss of love, lack of love, but also a love that doesn't work out. One of the most common misconceptions about love is that if you love each other enough, that everything will be fine. When the truth is that often it's precisely because two people love each other and they don't know how to love each other that they end up wounding each other. And so love can be both the cure, but it can also be the thing that wounds you. And I think it's important to see that love is both. Love is the wound that can only heal itself. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that means in this class. But that's sort of my theory of Miyazaki. Now, this idea, right, that love has two sides, that there is the beautiful animating part of love. Let's call it the side the lo where love is on the side of life. But as you will know that love is also thematically linked to death. Perhaps the most famous instance of love being linked to death would either be Romeo and Juliet, or it would be Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. Now, before we get to Romeo and Juliet, Wagner's Tristan and Isolde is perhaps a little bit less known in, in the culture today but it's essentially one of the greatest operatic masterpieces ever composed. And the culminating climactic moment in this opera is the final act, which is called Liebestod. And Liebestod is essentially German for love death. And it's crucial to note that love death is not the death of love, right? It's not that love has died nor is it that you find love within death, as in Romeo and Juliet, we lie together, now we have reunited the families. <clears throat> Instead, Liebestod describes the paradoxical 
condition in which the very act of love can feel like a fall into an abyss. Think about it. Hannah Arendt has this wonderful rule about how to know whether or not you're in love. She says, whether or not you're in love can be simply tested by the fact of whether or not you want to appear in public. Because when you're in love, you're a world unto yourself. Every true love represents a little death. The two of you are perfectly content. You have died to the world. It's like you have a friend and all of a sudden they're not hanging out with you. They're not responding to your messages. And so you're worried about them because you think, well, maybe they're depressed. But the truth is it could be the exact opposite. It could be that they found love. They're perfectly blissfully content, at least for a while. And so every love is a little death. Not only do you die to yourself, not only does the person who you thought you were die, but it's also that as a couple, you are dead to the world, at least for a little while. And there's a kind of blissful fall into this locked in subjectivity in which two people experience the world as one. For a brief moment of time, you are perfectly happy. You feel in sync with the world precisely because you are now out of sync with it. And you are out of sync in it, with it in a kind of lockstep with the other person. Now, to go back to Liebestod, the culminating act of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, the opera. What's interesting about Liebestod, and this is actually, Wagner wrote about this, Nietzsche wrote about this as well. I think it was Nietzsche who described it as the höchste Lust, which means the highest lust. Now, usually we don't think about lust and love as being compatible, right? We think that lust, lust is often something that can be threatening to love. The idea that you would succumb to more lustful urges. And yet the idea of höchste Lust is precisely the sublime element within love. Now, what do I mean by the sublime element within love? If you think about the Kantian sublime, Immanuel Kant's theory of the sublime. It's very interesting. He says, we don't know what God wants from us. And so the only way to act ethically is to act as if we knew what God wanted from us. Because obviously, no matter whether you believe in God or not, you can't just say, hey, God, give me a manual. There's the Ten Commandments, but those are mostly what you shouldn't do. And then you have an entire life that you have to spend thinking about what it is that you want to do. And so Wagner says, uh, not Wagner, Kant says that the whole idea of ethics, which is how to act in concordance with others, how to be in the world, is precisely this impossible position of trying to live in a manner that God wanted you to live, and yet having no clue what God wants from you. This is part of what Kant calls the sublime. It's a kind of fruitful impossibility. Now, what could be more sublime than a relationship? There is no manual for a relationship. When you're with another person and you're in love, you can't just tell the other person, how do you want me to be? How do you want me to act? Because if you were that kind of submissive person in a relationship, it would no longer be a relationship. And so when we're in love, when we're in a relationship, we find ourselves caught in the same ethical quandary that Kant talked about apropos God, which is the idea that in order to be in a loving relationship, you have to act as if you were in a loving relationship, if you will. No one's going to tell you how to do it. You have to navigate it yourself, which means that there's an analogy between our relationship to the absolute as what Kant called God and our relationship to love as we experience it with somebody else. There's no recipe for love. You can't say, well, if I do this, and then I make this dish, and then we listen to this music, and then we hold hands for X amount of minutes, love will enter the room. It's the exact opposite. You have to act as if you were love, and love will come through an open door. But of course, this is precisely what makes love so tenuous. It makes it something that can slip through your fingers. You can start doubting, is this love? It's one of the most common fears that people have is they're actually quite happy in a relationship. And yet 
you go to bed at night and you think to yourself, is this what love feels like? Is this it? How do I know? There is no test where at the end of it, you test positive of, or negative for love. But of course, this very doubting, this very questioning as to how to be properly in love is of course part of love itself. Now I wanna put that aside for a moment, we'll get back to that because we're still talking about Wagner and the idea of Tristan and Isolde. Now, I probably should have said before that the central plot device, if you will, of the Liebestod is the death of Tristan and Isolde. The death by drowning. I think Isolde is the one who drowns first. And it's one of the, I wanna say this very clearly, it's one of the absolute most beautiful moments in the history of music. It is almost impossible not to be moved, certainly not to be moved to tears by Liebestod. It's an incredibly affecting musical passage. And yet it is distinctly not sentimental. It's a great line from Adorno where he says that the greatest threat to love is sentimentality. And that's something that I believe completely. Sentimentality is often actually a barrier towards love. For example, think about sentimental greeting cards, like I'm thinking about you or Valentine's cards. How often are those cards actually a vehicle for the consummation of love? I don't think they usually are, which isn't to say that it's bad to send someone a card. Sometimes it's good to share sentimentality. And yet the sentimental is safe. In this sense, the sentimental functions similar to a crush. Remember, when you have a crush, the crush belongs to you. You can idolize the person. You can put them on a pedestal. And because they don't know about your love, strictly speaking, your love remains unrequited and yet cannot be unrequited by them. And that's the key distinction. It's a one-sided love. It's a one-directional kind of loving. And this can be good. It can be a training wheels for love, as I said before. And yet the sentimental functions in the same way. <clears throat> Strictly speaking, the definition of sentimentality is being in love with the idea of love itself. And when you're in love with the idea of love itself, similarly, it's safe. <clears throat> it's not something that threatens to devour you, that could consume you, that could turn you into a monstrous version of yourself. Because think about it, this goes all the way back to Plato's Symposium on Love, that love brings out vices. Jealousy is usually something that stems from love. I've certainly never, <clears throat> excuse me, I've certainly never been a jealous type. And yet if I'm in love, I become a lot more jealous than I would like. For Plato, love is a kind of madness. It's a fall from subjective reason into being prey to a lot of the lowest emotions that of course come hand in hand with the highest. You can't really detach them. It's also why Freud said that you are never more defenseless in the face of suffering than when you are in love, which should be amended to the idea that you are never more defenseless in the face of folly than when you are falling in love, which means that you can become jealous, you can become needy, you can suddenly become someone who you don't even recognize, like what is going on with me? And yet sentimentality is safe. Sentimental is falling in love with the idea of love. It's also why, for example, when you're in love, right? And you're in a relationship and it's not working out and you feel like you want to, you want to save it somehow. Many people will do something like, let's have a romantic dinner, let's go out, let's light a candle, let's put on Stevie Wonder. And yet all of those things can sometimes make it worse because not only are you forcing it, but you've taken love, which is a kind of confusing passion, and you've turned it into sentimentality. Now you're performing love as if it were the movies. And let me tell you something, most movies don't show you love, at least not ugly crying, eating cereal and crying into your cereal bowl love. Remember, this is Goethe's line. Goethe said that you haven't lived unless you've cried into your daily bread. That's, love, both the pain and the beauty and the obsession of it. And so movies show you sentimentality. It's sentimental love. It's love that looks good on a postcard and it's safe. And it's also why we like consuming it. 
There's a great scene in a movie that I like very much called Phantom Thread. And in Phantom Thread, we have a relationship drama between a man, a slightly older man, who is a tailor. He makes clothes, beautiful women's clothing. And a woman, Alma, which is Latin for soul, right? Who is his muse, significantly younger. And it's not even that he's interested in her sexually, he's interested in her for her body because she wears clothes so well. And while he's with her, he feels creatively impassioned. In this sense, she's traditionally a muse, right? And there's a beautiful scene in The Phantom Thread where she thinks that what she is lacking in tenderness in her relationship, and yes, Daniel Day-Lewis is the protagonist, that it will be solved if she can make a nice dinner for him. And so he goes out for an evening walk and she makes a candlelight dinner and she puts on music and it's very romantic and he's sitting down with her for dinner. And of course, you can already guess that the whole thing goes haywire. It has the exact opposite outcome. It doesn't make their relationship better. In fact, he frames it like this. He says, why did you ambush me? He says, the dinner is an ambush. And the problem with sentimentality is that sentimentality can be an ambush. Sentimentality is not often shared. Sentimentality is usually a private imagination of how you would like something to be. It's so one of the hardest things when you're growing up is that you have a certain idea of what love looks like, and then you realize that love looks completely different for different people. You may have certain moments that feel like a movie in which you are the main character, and yet often if you're trying to force love, you end up creating the exact opposite. You can't inhabit it. And so Wagner's Tristan and Isolde is precisely not sentimental. It's not Wagner staging Tristan and Isolde in the boat and he's rowing the boat and she's fanning herself and they eat cheese and drink wine and have a beautiful day out on the lake. It's the exact opposite. It's they drown, they succumb to Liebestod. It's the highest moment of love in the sort of culminating moment of life, which is of course death. And this equation between love and death isn't unique to Tristan and Isolde. It's something that we see throughout art. And this is precisely the sublime within love, that if love is the thing that makes life worth living, then in a sense, it also has its own internal limit, which is the idea of death. When you get married, you say, till death do us part. There's a great cartoon that I saw in The New Yorker where a man and a woman have passed away and they're in front of the pearly gates and they're about to be judged. Who gets to go to heaven and who gets to go to hell? And the woman turns to the man and she says, well, I guess this is where we part ways. Of course, the idea being that now they've succumbed, they're no longer together, but also that she lived a good life and he didn't. The last thing I want to say about Wagner's Tristan and Isolde is that if you look at the musical piece, and I highly encourage you to listen to it online, I once invited, when I was still a professor, um, at the University of Oxford Brooks, I once invited my students to come to a performance of it. And I, I made my case, I pitched the idea of going to see a performance of Liebestod, and it was only the last piece that was being performed. And no surprise, I ended up going by myself because no one wanted to come, because opera is not cool, which I understand. And yet, one of the happiest moments in my career as an educator was when one of my students came to me and he said, I've listened to Liebestod on YouTube, and I want you to know that I really regret not going to the concert. And I thought that was amazing. I thought that was wonderful. Because what makes Liebestod so affecting, and it's often used in movies, actually, you'll find. What makes it so affecting isn't that it's sentimental. In this sense, Liebestod is totally different from what you associate with romantic piano music something like Chopin, something that's easing on the nerves. It's not a gentle melody. In fact, the musical progression of Liebestod mirrors what you might call the unconsummated love. There's a great deleted scene from one of the Star Wars movies in which Luke leans in to have a kiss with Leia. We all know how that end, ends up. Luke leans in to kiss Leia, and right before their lips meet, CP3O comes in and ruins it. And that's exactly what happens in Liebestod. Part of why it's so affecting is it doesn't build up in a, cement, a sentimental 
growth to a climax. It's constantly reaching the peak and holding back. The string orchestra comes together and then holds back. And this constant surging of tension that never finds a true climactic release is what makes Liebestod so beautiful. And at the very end, when it comes together, it's slightly atemporal. There's love and the consummation of love is the ideal, but also love is the consuming fire that eliminates your subjective self. Liebe is taught, and yet a slightly disjointed part in the music. It's not quite perfect, and that's what makes it perfect. It's the perfection of imperfection, something that Wagner knew perfectly well. And you spell it Liebestod, which is L-I-E. Yeah, someone already did it in the comments. We have German students who are helping us out. That's wonderful. Makes me so happy. Thank you. And so I want to relate this idea of Liebestod to a psychoanalytic concept, which is known as the death drive. Take a sip, sip of coffee. <laughs> now, the death drive is an idea that's developed within Freudian psychoanalysis and Lacanian psychoanalysis and Slavoj Žižek has often referred to it as well. Now, what's really important to note about the death drive is it actually has more to do with life than with death. If you think about the death drive, it's definitely not this idea that we are self-destructive innately. It's not that all life is the slow, organic decomposition of our own selves, that once we've reached a certain peak of maturity, it's all downhill from here. It's not the fact that every time you eat food, you're also kind of wearing out your organs a little bit, that every time you wake up in the morning, you're one day closer to death, etc. That would be a depressing nihilistic take on the death drive. Instead, the idea of the death drive has to do with life and with a very specific paradox that I think is true to all human beings, which is what makes us feel most alive? Well, what makes us feel most alive is usually something seemingly mundane that we that we elevate to an almost metaphysical level now it's abstract but what i mean by that is for example if you're a long distance runner if you're a long distance runner you're going through the act of repetition you're simply mechanically repeating an action and some runners experience a so-called runner's high and a runner's high is this elusive state of being in which you've succumbed to pure flow in which suddenly you feel detached from your own body and you feel sort of blissfully in tune or in sync with the world. And here we have one of the paradoxes of death drive, which is that why is it that this state of the runner's high happens only at the moment at which you've, in a sense, turned yourself into a kind of running robot, an automaton of a human being, that once you've ceded control and life simply becomes running, suddenly you feel more alive than ever before. It's a weird paradox. And the two key elements of this paradox are of course repetition, the fact that you're doing something over and over and over again. It's like, try saying the same word 20 times in a row, it starts to lose its meaning. It becomes something totally new, something kind of exciting and meaningless. And why am I making these words? There are these sounds. So there's an element of repetition that leads to the metaphysical experience. But of course, there's also an element of desubjectivization, saying, I am no longer in my own experience. Now something is living through me. And of course, that's exactly how we describe the creative process. Many artists, many writers say, I didn't plan this. It didn't come to me naturally. It felt like the words were being spoken through me. It felt like the image was coming to me through something. Now, in ancient times, people would usually say, well, this was divine providence. This was God speaking through you, divine inspiration. But it doesn't have to be God. Instead, the principle still applies, which is that it's the principle of the sublime, which is I've suddenly created something and I don't know how I created it. And if I didn't look at it for a month, I would go back to it and say, wow, I made this thing. Somehow I tapped into something that allowed me to be creative. I don't know where it came from. I guess it was in me already. 
but it's like it revealed itself to me in the process of my own revelation, which is that you start writing, you start painting, you start creating, and you've made something. But you've made something that weirdly enough says more about you. It's like you've revealed something to yourself. And of course, one of the beauties of art is that this functions as a mirror, which is that if somebody else sees your art, they might have a revelation about their own selves. It's like this conjoin conjoining, this meeting of two mutual revelatory processes by which one person says, I created this thing and I don't know where it came from, but it came from somewhere within me as if I were possessed. And then somebody else says, within the thing that you've created, I found my true self. Of course, you will instantly recognize that we have here an analogy for what love is. Last week in the tutorial on love, I said that love is a mutual revelatory process in which you discover your true self refracted to you by the other in an almost miraculous way. Now, running can be one way to experience this. The runner is high. You could be in the mountain. And when you're in a mountain, you suddenly experience a very strong sense of subjective selfhood, which is again a paradox because you will never feel more small than when you are on a mountaintop. When suddenly your subjective self is confronted with the fact that as we all say, we're stuck on this floating rock in space. And so weirdly enough, it's like the more we're confronted with the abyss of just the universal concrete size of everything else that we start realizing our own self. It's a very interesting process to me, which is that sometimes it's when you feel more small, you feel more true to yourself. And vice versa, one of the things that happens to people who suffer psychological distress is that they can have illusions of grandeur that a sign that they're disconnected from reality is that they think that they are the mountain, that they are God, that they have become the king. The bigger we think we are, usually the smaller we've reduced ourselves to. And the smaller we make ourselves, the bigger and the more connected we feel with our subjectivity. And this, I want to be very clear here, this is because of the double meaning of the word subject. You are subject, as in you are a person. By means of subjecting yourself, you have to be subject to. This is the paradoxical condition of death drive, which is that when I become subject to something, I've de-subjectivized myself, whether it's through running or through climbing to a mountaintop, whether it's falling in love or having children. When I've become subject to something or someone, I've become more myself. It's the beautiful paradox of love, which is the beautiful paradox of the absolute, which is a refraction of you, because the subjective is simply the particular. This is a very old-fashioned theological description of love and agape, which isn't just unconditional love, but is precisely the manifestation of the absolute within that which is supposed to be a fall from the absolute, which is the particular subject. Finite mortal beings who find within themselves the grace of God. It's a theological nicety, that also reveals a metaphysical argument about the relationship between the absolute and the particular. But let's put that aside for a moment. So death drive is this weirdly animating paradox of life, whereby you feel most alive at the exact point that you've kind of corpsified yourself. And that's also what a relationship is, right? People who say, I'm a realist, I don't want to be in a relationship because relationships cost money and time and energy and they will probably hurt you. Those people are right, but for the wrong reasons. Namely, if a relationship costs time and money and energy and it will hurt you, well, what do you think life without love does to you? It costs you all your time, all your energy, and it will definitely hurt you because it will kill you. And this is the whole thing about love. Love should never be an antidote to the pain of life, to the mundane reality, which is existence. There's a great line from Moliere that I always think about in relation to the death drive, which is that he says, we have but one death and yet it lasts so long. 
And this one death that lasts so long is precisely the idea of living without having loved or being loved. Life without love is a long-lasting death. And it's precisely within love, within being subject to someone, this kind of desubjectivizing process in which a certain part of you dies, that suddenly life comes into being. It's a weirdly wonderful paradox of love. And so if we look, for example, at the, one of the most well-known stories of love, Romeo and Juliet, we find here essentially a very similar idea, which is that, first of all, what makes Romeo and Juliet a story of young love is precisely that it's a love that is all-consuming. There is no universe in which Romeo and Juliet simply go to have a milkshake, hold hands, go to the country fair, get married, get a job, have children, and live happily after after, ha happily ever after. For Romeo and Juliet, there is nothing more romantic than dying for the other person. This is again the flip side of love, the idea of death. If you say, I'm committing my life to you, you've kind of said, I've committed my death to you. You are the person who is the person who consumes me. It's very different from marriage. When you get married and you sign a contract, because let's remember that there is a contractual element to most marriages, it's actually saying, I plan to spend the rest of my life with you and we will take care of each other when we face the inevitable decline. No such thing in Romeo and Juliet. It's not inevitable decline. Instead, it's the, pardon my French, but almost orgasmic abyss of falling into nothingness. What makes Romeo and Juliet romantic isn't that they make it work. What makes it romantic is that they're willing to throw away everything for each other. And what's important here is that, I wanna stress, Hurting yourself or hurting others or committing suicide or whatever is not romantic love. That is not what love is. Romeo and Juliet is a metaphor for what happens within love. It's not prescriptive. It's not telling people to succumb to love. Imagine a parent that says you can't watch Romeo and Juliet because we worry you're going to imitate it. Instead, the truth of Romeo and Juliet is a truth that everybody knows who is in love for the first time which is that it is all-consuming. Not only does it burn you, but it seems to scorch the rest of the world. We never love as fiercely as when we're in love for the first time. It devours you. And this is also why many people's first experience of love can be so devastating, because you go all in. It's like you don't know any better. Of course, once you've been hurt, it means that you have to learn to love again. And that's why we're back at the Oscar Wilde quote where he says that the love, uh, the heart was meant to be broken, but the heart was also meant to be healed. This is the central lesson of Parsifal, Wagner's opera Parsifal, that the character has a wound that is keeping him alive and yet it's also the wound that is killing him. And here we have the analogy that you have to draw if you're aware of Parsifal, Wagner's opera Parsifal, versus Miyazaki's Princess Mononoke. In Princess Mononoke, we have a character who bears a wound that is literally killing him, and yet it is also the thing that is healing him. It's the thing that's bringing him out of the innocence and the naivete of youth and of childhood into the much more paradoxical and raw experience of adulthood. That's what Princess Mononoke is about, is realizing that the world isn't as simple as it seems, that there are great highs and great lows, and that evil isn't black and white. It's, I said this before, Hegel's great theory of evil, the philosopher Hegel, is that the good which believes itself to be absolutely good is itself evil. And Let's face it, that's often the realization people have in relationships, which is that I wasn't the perfect partner. I wasn't the perfect lover. 
Does that mean I could never love again? Does that mean that I shouldn't be with someone while I hurt them? And vice versa, I've been hurt by somebody else. The person I thought was the person I loved has turned out to be the person who's hurt me more than anybody else. Does that make that person my enemy? How do you go from being the person that you can no longer live without to being the person that you have to pretend to be strangers with? It's one of the most painful experiences in life. And so there's a great line, I think it's like from Blake, about friendship where he says that, do be my enemy for friendship's sake. And I love that idea, right? Which is that when you are in love, you are also saying, you are not just my greatest passion, but you are also my nemesis. Because I care about you, you're important. I'll go to the mat for you, I will fight for you. There's no such thing as winning an argument when you're in love. In the same exact way that in a healthy relationship, every win is a win for both of you. If you win an argument, you haven't won. You've lost because you've also hurt the other person. Anyway, I don't want to like go into the woods on that, but love isn't just that which heals. It is also that which causes the wound. It is one and the same thing. This is also why a lot of people, for example, if you've gone through heartbreak, one of the first things that we think is, well, what will solve my heartbreak is you think more love. And so you throw yourself into another relationship because you want to have that which you've just lost. And that can be really dangerous because this is principle that holds true for all life. You can't hit the repeat button on life. I mean, there's things that you do over and over like eating and drinking but when something was truly special, when it mattered, part of what made it special was that it was fleeting, that it didn't last, that if you try to recreate it, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. And why? It's a very simple answer. If you followed this tutorial so far, you'll know. It's because repeating something that was sublime is sentimental. You've succumbed to the trap of sentimentality. And this is exactly what happens when people break up and they launch themselves into another relationship. Not only is it dishonest for the other person, because now you're basically using them as like a prop to reenact that which you've just lost. But it's sentimental because you're staging the very thing that used to bring you to great heights and it's bound to fail, it's bound to be painful. And so one of the weird things about love, and I've experienced this myself, is that when you've experienced a great love together with a great loss, the only way to love again isn't to repeat, but it's actually to recover and then start again as if you hadn't loved before. Which means that it's about recovery. It's not about forgiving or forgetting or anything. It's not about arbitrating the past. Everybody has baggage. And yet, if you didn't have baggage, you would be clothless, right? We think of baggage as being negative, but baggage is the accumulation of experience. I believe very strongly that if you have experienced the flip side of love, the pain and the anguish and the suffering of love, as Freud said, I said this before, you are never more defenseless in the face of suffering than when you are in love. When you've experienced that, I genuinely think it makes you a better lover, a better partner, because you know the truth of it. Remember when you're young, all you see in love is bliss, which is precisely why you can't distinguish love from death. Love equals the annihilation of the self. It's a release from subjective being. And yet the flip side of love when you get hurt is precisely realizing that love is also part of life because life is simply continuing on once things have been done to you. It's Sartre's great line about existentialism. Sartre says, life is not about what you do. It's about what you do with what has been done to you. And that is so true because when you go through heartbreak, something has been done to you. And it's not just something you've done to yourself. The other person has played a role in it. And so learning to love again and learning to heal and learning to have life is simply the repetitive act of learning to love again, to do something with what has been done to you. I think that's so important because the thing is, 
we think about relationships as like a success or a failure. And one of the problems about failure is that if a relationship quote unquote fails, then you think that you are a failure, which is so wild to me because first of all, there's no metric for determining the success of a relationship. That would be sentimental. A relationship isn't better because it lasts longer. You can't measure the validity of a relationship based on its duration. Love isn't about longevity. Certainly love can grow and it can change over time. Certainly, I think it's lucky to have experienced love over a long period of time, but you can have great love stories that are very short, that are very all-consuming, that teach you something vital and fundamental about yourself and about life. Love isn't about longevity. Love is about that blissful moment in which suddenly nothing else seems to matter. Love is a kind of death. I think that's really important. And it's because life is a kind of death, because love is a kind of death, that it attaches you more to life. That's what the death drive is, remember. The death drive is simply the paradoxical experience by something which is experienced as a kind of little death, makes you feel more alive than ever before. And you know that one of the French euphemisms for an orgasm is a petit mort. It's a little death. That orgasmic metaphysical experience of being outside of your own body and merging with another human being is a moment of bliss. And this is the Liebestod. Because Wagner in Liebestod, he's being a little bit raunchy, if you think about it. The entire sequence of Liebestod is the sequence of orgasm. It's the building up and it's the weaving away and it's the repetitive part. And there's a moment in which it is extended and the musical sequence is extended beyond what you think is possible into a final climactic release. It's a very dirty piece of art. When people used to go and see Liebestod when it first premiered 200 years ago, people would regularly faint in the theater. No joke. Not only because it was so intense, because it was just so wild, it was rated R, if you will. And this is precisely, again, what is called the Höchstelust, the combination of the highest and the lowest. It's a great statue. It's a Buddhist monk. And I saw this in the Seattle Art Museum a couple of years ago. And it's called Buddhist Monk at the Moment of Reaching Nirvana. And it's a really fascinating statue because the monk is contorted. He's like this. And you can't see if the monk is in pain or if he's in ecstasy. Potentially both. Because the very idea of entering nirvana, the idea of entering heaven, it's not a particular mortal finite expression of sentimentality. It's not, I feel good, I feel bad. It's a feeling that defies the idea of feeling itself. It's simply the Buddhist idea of the sublime. And so this figure of the monk is contorted into a figure of both pain and suffering and a figure of bliss and enlightenment. And this is exactly to go back to what love is, which is that love isn't the antidote to pain. Love can bring pain. Love and pain are two sides of the same coin. In the same way that love and madness are two sides of the same coin. I think it's really important, I said this in a clip the other day, and I'm sorry if this sounds like advice, but if you're going into a relationship, if you can sense that you are falling in love, first of all, it's already probably too late. But secondly, don't ask yourself, will I get hurt? Because then you're going to say, well, yeah, I'll probably get hurt, so I might as well not do it. The question you should ask yourself isn't, will I get hurt? But will it have been worth it? That's a much more important question. You can't figure out how to love, like walking on the side of the pool, imagining what it's like to swim. You have to throw yourself in the water. You can't learn to love from a distance. It's so important. There is a kind of subjective release where you just have to go for it, which is why love takes courage. I've said this many, many times on my channel, is that love is a scary proposition. I believe that everybody who has the courage to love completely is an immensely strong person.
It's a line from Thomas Hardy, the novelist. He says that to love requires strength. I think that's so fundamentally important because we have created this weird narrative in our society where love is weakness because love is sentimental and it's about feelings and strength is about never showing feelings and having cold heart calculating rationale. And yet that's such an idiotic way of approaching life because in order to feel, in order to be vulnerable to somebody, in order to experience the highest and the lowest, it takes courage. And people who create protective layers around themselves, they don't do it because they want to be alone. They do it because they've been hurt and they never want to hurt that bad again. But think about it, this is the source of all strength. Strength isn't saying I can do anything. Strength isn't saying I'm all powerful. Most people who are really strong are strong because they were hurt once and they never want to hurt again. You think about it, you go through a love experience of unrequited love or someone broke up with you and you're hurting, you're in more pain than you've ever been in before. And you think to yourself, I want to be strong. Well, there's two ways that you can be strong. You can be strong by fortifying yourself, by creating this castle that belongs only to you, that you defend against the onslaught of people who might make you fall in love. But all castles crumble. All castles are sand castles, right? It's an illusion that it would remain forever. And so real strength isn't saying, I'm going to beat a retreat from love. Real strength is saying, I've loved and I've lost, but I can learn to love again. I think that's really, really important. I think that Falling in love isn't, oh, I'm weak, I've succumbed to it. I think it takes a lot of strength to allow somebody else to have such an important role in your life. Anyway, that I don't want to sound like I'm giving advice, but that's what I believe. Now, this whole idea of the death drive and love as being of two sides of the coin between love and hate, that love can make you hate and that you can also hate the fact that you are loving, right? Because a lot of people, when they fall in love, their first response is, ha, ah, here we go again. It's like an unwanted love. It just happens to you. I want to relate this idea also to another Christian idea, a theological idea, which is that Christ says to his followers, this, to my mind, actually the most important passage in the New Testament, I will not be gone because where you find love, you will find me. And I find that really, really beautiful because within a theological approach, which is also a philosophical approach, remember, for example, Hegel is one of the greatest Christian thinkers as well as one of the greatest living philosophers. The idea of Hegelian speculative idealism is all about spirit capital S, which is another word for love. Like people don't always realize this, but Hegel is the philosopher of love. Hegel believes that the manner in which love functions is a vehicle for how everything in the world functions. Everything is about love. And Hegel relates that back to the New Testament. The idea being that God, who is up here in his castle, essentially, has to subjectivize himself by becoming God incarnate, the idea of Jesus Christ, who then succumbs, of course, to human hatred, who succumbs to pain and suffering and loss and loneliness and dies on the cross. And this whole idea of I've died for your sins and redemptive, etc., all it means is that God is not going to do it for you. After the death of Christ, human beings are fundamentally alone. Think about it. The story is that God sends his son, human beings kill said son. But the point for Hegel is twofold, which is that God isn't just sending an emissary. Christ isn't a messenger of God. Instead, what Christ, I've said what God is doing is God is becoming subject to humans. It's one of the most radical inversions within any religion. The idea that the Almighty, the representative of the absolute, would not only come down from heaven, but would subjectivize themselves so completely as to be annihilated by the other. In a sense, you could see it as God has a love relationship with humanity. 
And human beings hurt God. Human beings kill the Son of God. But this is precisely for Hegel the second point, which is that God only truly becomes God, or the absolute, by means of falling into subjective selfhood. Which vice versa creates a mirroring effect, which is now particular finite mortal human beings suddenly find a godlike universal substance amongst themselves within the idea of love. And so love is that which both elevates you and causes a kind of fall, a kind of a fall into a spiritual abyss of true selfhood found in the other, and yet the elevation into a metaphysical plane where you feel more alive than ever before. It's this gyrating motion of the highest and the lowest, of the sacred and the profane that we find only within the experience of love. There's a great line in one of my favorite TV shows called The Young Pope, directed by Paolo Sorrentino, where Jude Law, who plays the young pope, he says, I don't want to have people who like the church. I want to have great love stories. And what he means by that, it's a very radical thing to say, right? I mean, the tagline for the TV show is his religion is revolution, is that love is this kind of revolution. That the idea that love is about, you know, just everything is love and McDonald's is love and greeting cards are love and everything is love is a sentimental idea. It's safe. It's, it, as soon as you say everything is love, it's good. I'm not against it. It's a good idea. But it's also safe. Because if everything is love, then kind of nothing is love. Love could be a sandwich. Love could be sending a nice message to someone. Love could be the thing that makes the world go round. Once you universalize love to that degree, love becomes sentimentality. It's also why people use the idea of love to sell things all the time, right? Buy this hamburger because you love it. Everybody knows it's not really love. No one bites into a hamburger and feels like they've died for a little moment. It's sentimental. It's the idea of love. It's loving the idea of love. And so what happens within the Christian narrative that Hegel observes, which is synonymous to the narrative that you find for the Buddhist monk who finds the highest and the lowest pain and pleasure in the moment of the unification of the particular subjective body with the ideal of the absolute, or that you find within Parsifal, the wound that only heals itself, or within Wagner's ring cycle, where at the end of the ring cycle in Götterdämmerung, the heavens themselves burn down to the ground and humanity looks at, the, looks at the crowd and says, what now, what next? It is up to you. When Christ says to his followers, where you find love, you will find me, what he means is, don't go looking to heaven to find your salvation. It's so important. The New Testament is the release from the human, release of the human community from the idea that God will do it for you, that the answer is up there, that life is painful, but you will be released once you've let go of your mortal coils. Instead, the message of the New Testament is exactly the opposite, which is saying, don't expect heaven to solve it for you. Don't expect God to release you. You have to do it yourself on earth. And the way that you find heaven on earth is when you find love. There you will find me. It's the mirroring process, chiasmic if you will, by which God kills himself in order to materialize as love. The idea of the Holy Trinity, the idea of agape, so that human beings can achieve the universal, the absolute, the spiritual, between themselves as love. And so when you say all is love, you can't say everything is love. As soon as you say everything is love, it means nothing is love. You've trivialized love into sentimentality. But vice versa, when you say that love is how you access the all, that's when you've found the universal come particular, as Rancière would say, within love itself. The idea being that love is an access to the world. Suddenly the world is made manifest to you in its true shape and form and color through love, which requires a subjective emptying out on behalf of the other versus the idea that you're going to build a castle in which you have substitutes and placeholders for love, like hamburgers. And that's not love. And so I, I know I might not be very clear here because we're going to develop this in the tutorials, but there's a metaphysical argument about love to be made, which is that Love is an access to the absolute, but to absolutize love is not an access to the absolute. I'm not saying this very well, but we'll, 
we'll, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> now, I want to end on something here, which is that I said earlier that love is itself the wound that it is trying to heal. And the reason I said that is I don't want people to think that unless you are in love or unless you are finding love that your life is less meaningful or less profound or not worth living. I don't think that's true. I think that it's very important that we detach the idea of love from romantic love. Romantic love is simply one of the aspects of love. There are many ways to experience love. Self-love, love of community, the idea that you experience a kind of inexplicable happiness when you gaze out into the stars. There are many ways to experience love that don't trivialize love, that explore its many facets. An image that I like to use is that if you're in a photography studio, you can light someone, you can light the subject from many different corners and they will look different. And that's something that we can do when it comes to the idea of love. We can light the idea of love from different angles. We can see its different aspects. And so what I wanna do in the next couple of classes, is I wanna talk about the different types of love we can experience. Love in friendship, love in families, love in art, perhaps also even the idea of love for country or love for community. I wanna talk about the many different aspects and facets of love because in the last three weeks, we've talked about what love is. And then in the next couple of weeks, I wanna talk about what love does. I think that's really important. And so I wanna say thank you. I wanna say thank you for joining me today for this tutorial on love. I can't believe that we have 110 people in the live stream. That is incredible. So thank you guys so much. Um, and on YouTube as well, thank you guys for watching. Um, this has been a tutorial on love in which we started with Hayao Miyazaki theory of love is the encounter. I talked about Princess Mononoke. We've talked about Wagner's Trissa, the idea of the death drive, which we related to the idea of running and the idea of mountain climbing, which we talked about in relation to Romeo and Juliet and Parsifal and all those things. And I really, really hope that this has been valuable to you. I hope that spending time together thinking about love, taking love seriously, has also been a way for you to show self-love because this is how I like to start my week, thinking about these things, because I think that they allow me and I hope you to find the world more enriching. That's what it's about. I think that it's really important when you talk about philosophy, philosophy isn't just the love of wisdom, but it's also the wisdom of love. That there is a kind of animating spirit and drive and existential pursuit to the process of loving and being loved that is worthy of consideration. It is worthy of intellectual focus. And so together with you guys, I hope that we've honored that. We've thought seriously about one of the most important things that makes life worth living. So on that note, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. I see all the positive messages. They warm my heart. I wanna say a huge thank you for helping us get the Substack newsletter to 2000 uh, signups. That's amazing. If you'd like to join the newsletter, it's 100% free. And just click the link in bio. Uh, I love building a community of like-minded thinkers who just enjoy processing these things in a way that feels hopefully non-toxic and creates a nice safe space for us to do that together. That's super important to me. Um, I also wanna say thank you to all of our patrons who continue to fund these classes, who make them possible in the first place. We don't have a link for the Patreon up right now, but it's www.patreon.com dash Julian. Um, and if you'd like to join the Patreon where you can download all these tutorials as a podcast, you can access all my previous courses, you can download the eBooks that I've released, etc. Just send me a DM and we'll make sure that we get you signed up today. So thank you guys so much and I will see you all next week. All right. Love you all and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.